magic. Just pure magic. The giants, they're absolutely real, and I think they are real. It's really nice to commemorate the, the hundred years since the First World War. When war broke out, we had this forgotten king and country, and we meant it. May I do thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming forward and showing what is the spirit of Liverpool. It's a story of war, ideals, friends, pals in the true sense of the word. Pals who worked, played, and died together. Once upon a time, there was a grandmother, a little girl and her dog. The old lady was very tired because she traveled a long, long way. So she lay down and went to sleep. The people of the city were very curious. For days they came to see her, but she didn't stir. She slept on and on, dreaming of the story she would wake up to tell, a true story a story that should never be forgotten, the story of the Liverpool Pals. These are the men, and they are the story. A hundred years ago, they were Liverpool's giants. Timber Clark Arthur Cena was engaged to Florrie Ledson when he signed up. Nearly a hundred years later, his love letters would have their own story to tell. My own darling Florrie, before entering into the greatest battle the world has ever known, I thought I would leave a letter for you, requesting that it would be forwarded if I should be killed in action. In 1914, Liverpool was thriving. Trade had brought prosperity and a new generation of businessmen, educated, optimistic and patriotic. Their fathers owned shipping lines, they were bankers, buyers and brokers, and they were about to make a decision that would change their lives. More men were needed for the war, and in Liverpool, the 17th Earl of Derby had his own recruitment drive. He called for a battalion of pals, friends from the same workplace, who would fight shoulder to shoulder for the honor of Britain and the credit of Liverpool. The response from Merseyside was overwhelming. Within a few days, over 3,000 men enlisted here. I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's just mind blowing. <laughs> to commemorate the First World War, I think it's a brilliant idea. The four battalions lived in makeshift camps across Merseyside. Hooton Racecourse, the abandoned Prescott Watch Factory, Sefton Park and Knowsley were all transformed. But it was here at Lord Derby's home in Knowsley where the biggest transformation was taking place. A whole military community was springing up and the tranquil grounds were filled with the noise of military men in the making and the shifting of mud. <laughs> Learning to dig trenches was a major bugbear. We did that shocking digging at Nosley. We did hate that job.
was quite a lot of controversy, wasn't there, at the time about the men digging up the grounds for nothing? Was that well, that, that, <laughs> uh, the, you never want to let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> but yes, it was inevitable that when, when these men went off to uh, France, uh, that they would be digging, trenches would be important. Uh, and outside of Knowsley Hall here, the, the gardens used to be a gradually sweeping terrace or gently sloping down. And so what they did was they turned the garden into a series of terraces and walls and terraces and walls. Uh, and so what my great-grandfather, being an extremely honourable man, did was he wrote to three different civil contractors and got them all to quote for the work. And then he sent a cheque to the war office, not for the lowest, but for the highest quote. So he definitely didn't profit out of it. I'm not sure he really wanted his garden to all end up like that, but it's the way it <laughs> happened. Uh, and furthermore, the men, while they were doing it, they, they came up with a song about uh, digging Derby's clay. And, and, <laughs> and uh, in the end, the, the men grumbled a bit about well, how much digging they'd had to do. And so he made a further donation to, to benefit the men. So it talks about a bother day uh, in, in the song. <laughs> After months of training, and as a boost to morale, Lord Kitchener himself inspected the pals from the steps at St George's Hall. A hundred thousand people crowded onto the plateau to show their support. In seven months, their loved ones would be in France. Arthur Cena was one of eight children. The family owned Cena matchmakers and were rivals to Bryant and May. A talented athlete, he was planning to marry his sweetheart, Florrie. Peter, here we are in Christchurch, Bootle. What's the significance of you bringing me here? Well, this is the church where both my um, Uncle Reggie and Uncle Arthur both sang as choir boys. I see. And so they probably sit along here. He captained the Liverpool Pals football team, actually. Oh, did he? Yeah, and uh, he, he was a very good slow bowler at the local cricket club. Many years ago, I was speaking to um, and one of the older members who'd actually played in the same team as him about 1912, 1913, and he said he remembered him as the slowest of slow bowlers he'd ever played with. He said he, he threw the ball higher than anybody he'd ever seen, so he must have been pretty accurate. But I wonder whether those skills were instrumental in him being recruited as a bombardier. Who would be used, I suppose, to um, lob hand grenades. But it's his letters to fiancé Florrie Ledson that give an insight into the war. 23rd of June, 1916. My own darling Florrie, I am afraid that you will be thinking I am very pessimistic about things, but I am getting so many setbacks to my optimism lately. Days later, Arthur would go over the top in one of the bloodiest battles of the war. I love you with all my heart, Erie, and I am certain that you loved me.
Private Bill Wood had already seen his two brothers go to war. I've got here the most wonderful picture of, of the Powells at Knowsley yes. um, digging in. And this cheeky chappy has jumped in and um, jumped into the photograph. That's William. <laughs> and made them laugh. That's William. <laughs> and that's William. Is that yes. the sort of character he was? He was. Very much a joker. Very much uh, pulling everybody's leg and that's the way he was. He didn't need to go really. He was um, exempt as he was a farm manager and but he felt his duty was to go. Down the lane that leads to happiness and love. Bill leaving for the front was agony for his mother Ruth. When she cried he said, don't turn to see me go, Mum. And as he walked away from this house, he sang her this song. But I made this sacred promise with a parting kiss I gave. When the fields are white with daisies, I'll return. Bill Wood never returned. He died on the first day of the Somme. He was 27. Ruth Wood had already lost two sons to the Great War. Now she had lost a third and last. It was all too much to bear. My grandfather lost his life in the First World War. And I think it's marvellous. We should never forget people that fight, fought for their country. Heroic people. If it wasn't for people like them, we wouldn't be able to. We were back after 10 days of training, and I don't know when we will be going into the line. I expect any time now. Account of battle, 1st of July, 1916, for Montauban village. Every fighting officer was hit by enemy bullets or shells. It's hard to believe, Tony, that this is where it all happened, all started. Yeah, that's right, Sue. This is, I mean, it looks benign today, almost tranquil. Um, it's very peaceful and it belies its history. This is the killing fields of the 1st of July, 1916, at the Liverpool Pals. Where we are now was the starting off position. So here where we're standing, this would have been a trench. Yep, yeah, that's right, Sue. This would have been a trench because those flags show us the, uh, the actual start off point. So this would have been probably eight to 10 feet. You'd have had the ladders, the whistles would have gone. And as soon as the whistle went, they went over and then they were out in the open. In the open, yeah. And they could just be picked off. The other side of the field, over there where, over the, there wood where the wood is, that's where um, close to 200 men of the 18th Battalion, they fell just one machine gun position that hadn't been taken out, caused mayhem and, and all that. So. The loss to the 18th Battalion was, was horrendous. Oh, it's just awful. Despite the enormous loss of life, the Liverpool and Manchester Pals were only two of a handful of battalions who reached their objective that day. The capture of Montauban shone like a beacon. In charge of the 18th Battalion that day, Edward Henry Trotter, an exceptional leader of men. I make no apologies for saying this, 
He was one of the most marvellous men, not only a soldier, but one of the most marvellous men I ever had the good fortune to work with or work under would be Walker. This was the main family house, and they lived, as you can see, in, in some reasonable style. Mm -hmm. I think there were, there were four, 14 indoor servants in this house and five gardeners uh, looking after the grounds around. And, uh, and he, even on the fringes of his military life, was pretty smart. In contrast between that and, and crawling around in the mud on the Somme must have been considerable. Yes. When many of his men died here on the 1st of July, Colonel Trotter walked amongst their bodies, openly weeping. Seven days later, when a shell hit his trench, his men, the ones who remained, wept openly for him. Back home, people were beginning to feel uneasy about the upbeat reporting of the war. This film, from the battlefield, was shown in picture houses across the country. It's a combination of fact and propaganda, and the first chance for the relatives to witness the cruelty of the war. For hundreds of families, the worst was around the corner. The Battle of Guillemont would be the pal's biggest loss of life and bad weather would play its part. The Germans used the fog by stepping out of their own trenches. They took cover in the shell holes in front, took the machine guns with them. And when the pals left their trenches at 4.45 that morning and suddenly the fog lifted and they were out in the open without any cover. 463 men lost their lives that day. I think the patriotic fervour of St George's Hall is a million miles away from the reality of this here. For the injured, there was no medical help. And there was nobody to identify or bury the dead. They just lay in no man's land decaying in the August sun. or oh, they were blown to bits by further bombardments. It was Liverpool's blackest day. Twenty third of June, nineteen sixteen. My own darling Flory. We have had a very hard time of it recently, and I have not had a minute to ourselves. We celebrated the longest day of the year by starting out at four thirty a.m. and marching until eight thirty at night. I'm extremely proud of the pals, I always have been. The thing is, the, the story seems to have been forgotten in Liverpool, but the giants bring in that, the spectacle to the streets, the people coming out, they're getting the message, the message is getting over. The story and the heroics of the Liverpool pals is actually being told at long last. Those who survived the war returned home to mixed fortunes. Elizabeth's father, Tommy Milner, was 19 when he was blinded by a shell burst at the Somme. Treated at St Dunstan's Hospital, he was taught Braille and how to type. Very few people knew he couldn't see. When you were growing up with a little girl, did you know your dad was blind? 
He just behaved, you know, like anybody else's dad. He'd run up the road to meet him coming from work. He used to take himself into Liverpool to work by himself on the trams. And uh, I can remember going, waiting on the corner, running to meet him and walk back down with him, you know. And bring things home from school. I remember once, I remember this so vividly, I don't know why, bringing, it must have been a picture of something I'd done at school. And I said, look at this, Dad. And he said, oh, oh, isn't that lovely? And he sort of <laughs> looked at it. And I said, yeah. I'm looking at these beautiful cups here as well. I know there are uh, only a few of what you've got, but can you tell us about them, Elizabeth? Well, he, while he was at St Dunstan's, he became a rower. He'd never rowed before, because he became very proficient and very successful. Uh, won lots yeah. of regattas and things with his crew, crew. You were obviously very proud of your, oh, your yes. dad. He could do everything, really and truly. He was one of the lucky ones. Another 358 men who also worked at Liverpool's Cotton Exchange never came home. Good morning Welcome to the thing called life Good morning Don't you let it pass you by We laugh We cry And then we dry our eyes We fall I think it's wonderful that it has been portrayed in this way because it's brought attention to the story of the Pals uh, to people who hitherto wouldn't have known much about it. Once upon a time there was a grandmother, a little girl and a dog. They came to the city with a story to tell and the people came to listen. Now they must go, but their story will remain in Liverpool's hearts forever. On Sunday the 25th of June, 1916, Arthur Cena wrote his last letter home. I asked God at early communion this morning to forgive me all my sins. I'm sure that he will do, Flory. So I am not afraid to die. In fact, I am proud to die a soldier. Arthur Cena's letters survived the war, unlike Arthur and many others who didn't. He was shot down by a machine gun on the first day of the Somme. It was his 28th birthday. Arthur's body was never recovered from the battlefield. His name is recorded here at Tiepval Memorial, along with 73,000 others who have no known grave. 13 years after Arthur's death, Florrie Ledson would marry and have a daughter, Beryl. Well, she'd certainly have married him if he'd lived. There's no doubt about that. I don't, you know, I th he was her first love, really. Her true love? Her tr I think so, yes. I would say. And then I wouldn't have been here to tell the story, so. No. <laughs> you, well, that's true. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> yes, I mean, she must have often thought what her life would have been like if she'd married him. But uh, she was so close to his family that that was very, you know, that was rewarding in itself, I yes. would think. Yes. Florrie Ledson received this letter after Arthur's death. In it, a poem he'd written to the sweetheart he loved. I often think of the homeland and the future that's in store, of the bygone days, happy days, and the good old days of yore. Lord, take me back in safety over that narrow sea to Florrie, my darling Florrie, who waits in patience for me. This life has been hard and dreary. Our struggles will never be known. 
But how sweet will sound that music of that old song, Home Sweet Home. Good luck of lads, no doubt about that.